In this video, I'm conducting an interview with Wilcox Snellings after his Hall of Fame induction. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoy this video. Please like and subscribe and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and what you'd like to see in future videos so I can work on that. My book, Back Game and Back Game Strategies, is available. There's a link in the description to where you can get it. I must mention that uh, Wilcox did help me with the book, so I appreciate that. If you're interested in lessons, please contact me via email. My email address is in the description. Uh, and again, in this video, uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to have my good friend, uh, Wilcox Snellings. Thank you for joining me again, and welcome. Thank you, Alex. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and have a good reason for it. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's, uh, I'm always happy to see you, uh, and congratulations on everything, and you're back in uh, Costa Rica. Is that right? Yep, back back to work and in this uh, in this wonderful country and in good weather. So don't be too jealous. Yes. So how's the weather there now? Hey, it's almost ideal. It's a little windy at, at this point, but the temperatures run probably seventy to eighty-five. Okay, because I was talking to somebody else and they were telling me, oh, they're in Boston and the weather is good. I said, what's the temperature? Oh, it's in the fifties. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, right. It's all relative. If it was summer, you'd be cold, and if it's winter, you you feel good. Uh, okay, um, great. Yeah, I'm I'm not used to it. I'm from Southern California, so it's cold. Um, anyway, uh, I'm glad to hear all the good things. Congratulations on everything. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about um, your Hall of Fame induction and that whole experience. It was a uh, Quite an experience. Uh, not only did you win the Hall of Fame, uh, not only were you inducted into the Hall of Fame, but you won the tournament where it was being held. Uh, and that was the, the first tournament in the United States you've been to in 20 years. I don't think that's ever been done. Yeah, it's actually, I, I did try to go to Carol's, uh, Carol Cole's uh, Michigan tournament on July 4th or July 4th weekend, going back to 2019, but I uh, caught something, not COVID, it was pre-COVID days, but I caught some nasty flu and was unable to play in the tournament and sort of uh, managed to pair up with Steve Sachs to commentate on the finals, but that that was it. So otherwise, it's 27 years. It goes back to Vegas in 97 when I was last at a U.S. tournament. Yeah, you took a break from backgammon for some time. Um, okay, wonderful. So there is uh, there was a really nice... Hall of Fame induction ceremony, and I know you mentioned there's a video that will be on the USBGF uh, YouTube channel, so I'm looking forward to that. That's the actual ceremony, uh, but in this video, we'll be, we'll be able to talk a little bit more. Um, so what I wanted to start with um, is uh, reading the speech that uh, my good friend Joe Russell wrote, and your friend as well, um, he wrote this speech. He was unable to make it there, but uh, I believe Ken Goulding read it. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'll go ahead and read that. This is uh, what Joe wrote. Um, I am honored to give the induction speech for someone I consider to be one of the finest players in the history of backgammon and a good friend, Wilcox Snellings. Will is known throughout the backgammon community as one of the few elite players were a notch above the rest. Most know, but not everyone, that in the early 90s, he was considered the best player in the world by his peers. He was voted the top giant of backgammon twice and finished second in the voting once. He achieved this by placing in several prestigious events and by being the most feared money player on the planet. Bot analysis of his recorded matches has confirmed he played at a lower performance rating than anyone at the time. Will was taught the game by his grandfather when he was 16. He became more involved as a freshman at the University of Virginia. He played semi-regularly while working as an option trader for most of the next decade. After that, he played full-time for a few years at the Cottery Club in New York City. The Cottery Club was where the best of the best locked horns and steal their games. Will worked diligently and soon became the most respected money player at the club. Uh, one of the better players would rather avoid if possible. During this period, he also placed in many prestigious backgammon tournaments and provided outstanding commentary at the Backgammon World Championships, which earned him further respect. 
Will was not only brilliant at the game, but also dedicated and organized in the days before bots. If you did not understand the position player cube action and it did not lend itself to mathematical analysis, the only way to learn was to create a reference position. To do so, one would roll out games hundreds of times. Now, hundreds of rollouts do not seem like much when a bot can roll out a thousand games in minutes. But when you do it by hand, a hundred rollout might take several hours. Will estimates he spent 5,000 hours or more uh, doing hand rollouts. He says, when you do a hand rollout, you learn a lot about the game and how to play different positions that you may not learn from a bot. Will's dedication, gained knowledge, natural skill, and mathematical ability took him to the top of the backgammon world. Then at the peak of his dominance, he retired. He quit. He walked away. The best player in the world gave up the game for about 20 years. A business opportunity came along that could provide for financial security for him and his family, and family came first. Will worked hard or harder at his profession as he had worked at Backgammon, often putting in 70-hour work weeks. He used... His diligence, intelligence, and organizational skills to become one of the best in the world in his profession. But when his son became interested in backgammon, Will found his love for the game rekindled and started playing again. Pretty soon, he was testing his medal online and found that while he was still among the better players in the world, he was not in the top handful like he had been before he quit. But remember, diligent and organized... It was 2015 when Wilcox began using a tool new to him, XG, the bot, and he quickly found his level improving. He had always been eclectic in his play, not a style player, which made it easier for him to learn from XG analysis. Within months, he was challenging the top players to online matches and outplaying most of them while holding his own against the best. He was back, but not quite back to the very top, but that would change. In 2019, he decided he was ready to play in the Backgammon World Championships again. He had seen his online match performance rating drop to 2.8, placing him amongst the best in the world. He traveled to Monaco and played splendidly, making the final eight and playing with the lowest performance rating of anyone who played more than a few matches. Since then, he has played two more times and averaged a 2.9 over three trips, Culmination of his success came in 2022 when he made the finals of the undefeated bracket, and at one point he became 99% to advance to the finals of the world championship. He played a stellar 2.3 PR in that stressful match against eventual world champion Sander Lilov. In 2022, Will placed first in the Backgammon Super Genius Quiz, a contest created to be a book by James Vogel which featured 100 questions, 12 contestants, and $5,000 in prize money. He topped the very elite of the backgammon world in the quiz. Wilcox was back, and he was all the way back. He is now considered amongst the very best match players in the world. Not many people can reach the zenith of their chosen field, take 20 years off, and return and do it again. Wilcox did it. Kent Goulding refers to him as Rip Van Snellings. Nothing Like nothing has changed, he just went to sleep for 20 years and came back the backgammon beast he was before. Will deserves this honor for his great exhibition of skill over two different careers, but he is also one of the game's great ambassadors. He is friendly and approachable. He participates daily in backgammon commentary online and has been doing so for many years, helping many learn how Master thinks. And he is one of the very best commentators. His commentary at the three world championships he has attended in the last four years has been superb. And he is one of the more, more favored by the, listening, by the listening audience. He has also volunteered to do commentary on several USBGF ABT finals. To top it off, he sets a fine example as a great family man. I can think of no one more deserving of the Backgammon Hall of Fame than Wilcox Snellings. Welcome, Will. That concludes Joe's speech. So congratulations. I, I mean, I definitely agree with everything he said. Uh, the other thing is, of course, everyone knows you as a top player. Uh, but in addition, uh, you are a gentleman of the game. Um, everyone looks up to you. Um, it's just you set a good example for everyone. So congratulations on that.
Thanks, Alex. I, it, it's hard to know how to respond to that. I, I don't blush, but you know, if I did, I would be, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a lot. It's, it, it's appreciated. Yeah. What were um, the remarks that you gave when, uh, during the ceremony? If well, I have the remarks. It, it, it ended up, it was probably 11 minutes long. So um, the, the, uh, just as far as the highlights, I mean, I, I thanked, uh, I thank Joe in general because Joe's a very good friend and uh, he wrote the remarks that, uh, that Kent, Kent read, Kent, Kent ad-libbed a little bit as well. And I, I, I gave him some, some fodder for roasting me a little bit because it can't be, can't be all, you know, <laughs> uh, a halo effect or something but um i thank joe also for helping me uh he was one of the two key people uh to give me the opportunity that uh, the business opportunity that i that i took up and uh and ran with uh, many years ago um i my family was there uh, so it was my my stepfather and my uh an aunt and uncle at Mainly, of course, my my wife and daughter, and as well uh, a niece and uh, her husband, a niece of, of my wife, and so that that was terrific. We had a you know large table kind of centered in the room, and when I was reading my speech, I could I could look uh, look at I looked at many people, but I could look at them as my as my ground. Um, and other things, you know, I talked about backhand and what what it's what it's meant to me. Um, the combination of uh, features of, of the game that I find so uh, appealing and challenging at the same time. Um, I mentioned briefly the relationship between uh, life and backgammon in terms of, um, you know, no matter how well prepared you are, there's going to be, you know, variables anywhere from a little luck to a lot of luck, which can cut in both directions. And um, what else did I talk about? Uh, let's see. I did. I did happen happen to mention, which was, uh, I I I thought about this. I think I, because I had family there, I did insert for about a minute. I don't think it took much longer than a minute. Uh, the the family losses that that we've experienced. Uh, that was mainly that was all last year, and uh, and I I did that both because some of my family was there, and and also, as I said, it was kind of a, a reminder that. You know of what's important in, in life, and and uh, backhand is a wonderful game. The community is great. I have tons of friends in the U.S. and some abroad, and um, and and that's that's terrific. But um, you know, keep, keeping keeping attention. Hey, I'm fortunate, and I have a fair amount of family, even if I've you know, lost some very important members of that family. But uh, you know, that's that's still my focus, and that was part of the reason it wasn't so difficult for me. When I did stop playing backgammon in, um, in, in the '90s, I knew I was taking on the responsibility of a family, and it wasn't easy to make a lot of money in, in backgammon at that point. It was more difficult for me than it had been. So, unless you knew some Russian or oligarchs, or you were you were in bed with <laughs> the Texas Oil Club or something, um, you know, I had to find a way to 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 make money in other ways, and and there's only so many hours in the day. So that was, uh, I didn't quit because I was bored with it. I didn't quit because, uh, well, you know, that, that I've done that, check, check that off. You know, I still really like the game and I have a lot of friends in the, in the community, but um, back then I'll keep this part brief, but, but when I did stop, I was living in Vegas. So there's two tournaments in Vegas every year. And uh, I, the first tournament I went to when I'd already decided I'm gonna stop, I didn't say I'll, I'll never play again. It wasn't some extreme comment statement I was making. But I went to that tournament and I saw some friends and I had a couple of meals with them. And, but in the playing room, I felt as if, again, this may sound very strange to say, but I give myself a get out of jail free card. Like, like I was, it, it, because part, you know, part of any of these games, and it depends on your personality, but it's that, uh, you know, what, what part is the love of what you're doing? And what part is a form of addiction? Not necessarily a bad addiction. It's not drugs or something like that. But um, yeah, I think in my case, I was getting off a, a treadmill. Like I, I had accomplished a lot of what I wanted to and some that I didn't even imagine that I would, you know, re reaching the level that I did. And I, I was, I felt, I felt fine about getting off of that, uh, that path, at least for a while at that point. 
Yeah, it was it was unbelievable. It's uh, certainly I think that weekend was an experience of a lifetime. I mean, just being inducted into the Hall of Fame is, you know, very, very rare, obviously, in, in any field. Um, and you were able to do that. So that was outstanding. But in addition, I felt like the fact that it was in New York, that's where you grew up most of your life. It was a reunion and you were able to have uh, your family there. So I know that was very special to you. Yeah, I mean, New York was, uh, you know, was was everything. I had a lot of family in Louisiana and, and I still, you know, still go there sometimes. And when I was growing up, I would go there six weeks a year. But essentially, I, you know, I grew up in, in, the, in the city and went to a pretty good private school there and um you know had a lot of friends played you know different different guys I was always playing games so even if I was playing poker by age 12 or you know not just like great but like better than you know better than my friends um yeah there's so much going on in New York and then the Coterie Club late later on and there were some other clubs before the Coterie so when I was younger when I was like 17 18 19 years old um I went to a club the Mayfair was the really well recognized mm -hmm. club back then, but you know the the stakes there, even the minimum stakes were were pretty high, and you know my my capital was was quite lean, essentially allowance and maybe a, some small poker winnings or something. Um, and but there was a place called the Game Room, which was a much seedier establishment, let's put it that way, um, and still had some decent players. And late at night, you know, so McGreal would occasionally wander in, and Eric Seidel, um, you know, from the poker fame and also he was a great backhand player he was a year older than me but he was he was playing there and I got to watch some very good players and play for low stakes when I was uh, when I was playing there but and the, and then later the coterie which was um kind of a, a dream opportunity to, to really you know continue to my, my learning curve and and to watch and play with you know clearly just uh, had some household names back then yeah yeah and I know the uh, induction ceremony was in kind of the middle of the tournament on Saturday evening. So at that point, you were still in the tournament. But to top everything off, you ended up winning the entire tournament. And this was your first tournament in the United States in 27 years. And you hadn't really practiced as much as uh, you had been. Uh, I know you had mentioned to me, usually uh, practice an hour a day, but you were practicing about one sixth of that uh, in the previous months coming up to it. So that's, that's quite remarkable. Um, tell us about that, please. Yeah, normally during my heavy work part of the year, which, which runs mid October until early June, but, but especially there are like six and a half months that are particularly intense. And I am I'm working like 70 hours a week. So I get, small breaks dur during the middle of the day and during that time i'll look at some facebook posts on positions and not i won't methodically play an hour a day but maybe i'll play two hours one day on a light schedule and you know not play the next day but i probably average playing yeah you know, like i said uh, about an hour a day in addition to spending maybe 20 minutes looking at some facebook positions and answering and checking answers and, and that sort of thing but this time I, I don't know what it was. I mean, um, I didn't go into, you know, wh whatever it was early August and, and said, I'm just calling a timeout from backhand. But other things were going on and family and and not playing wasn't really bothering me. I didn't feel the, the bug that I should, you know, should be playing. And it just sort of went on like that. And, and finally, before I knew I was going to the tournament, I knew I was going to play in the main event. And the prior two weeks, um i played i actually hadn't played any matches uh, until uh, this was i was just playing practice money games with a good friend of mine for this part and then i played some matches for parts the last i think three weeks and was you know playing playing well uh, um you know i felt good about my game but you know you're not really in complete rhythm but you just have no idea how the, how first of all there's a lot of randomness right? and just we have to allow for that and beyond the randomness, you know, it's possible that because I wasn't focused quite as much, and I obviously have focused an awful lot in my life on the game, and you know, even in the last uh, ten years or so, that um, you know, I was I was pretty relaxed, and subconsciously everything is still 
there and my, my job is very mentally demanding. So I think my, my mind is pretty sharp. And, um, who knows? And I told my wife before when we were on the plane, I said, this is the first tournament I've ever gone to where I know I'm coming back with something, namely the award, you know, the, the Hall of Fame award. And, uh, and she said, how does it make you feel? I said, I don't know, maybe more relaxed. Uh, it's hard to say. Yeah, that's nice. And the, for people that are watching this video that do not know, there are not many people that can play at the level that you're playing. You can probably count them on one hand. Uh, I know I've been studying, you know, and I, I've never gotten to, you know, those kinds of levels. And I feel like uh, when you first start studying, it's pretty easy to get from like a novice level to an intermediate or an intermediate to an advanced and so forth. But when you're getting to that level, when you're where your PRs are in the twos, you're basically having very few errors. So there's not that much uh, to improve on. How how is it that you have been able to get to that level and maintain it consistently? Well, I mean the the thing I what we don't know the exact data, but my my guess would be that in the '90s when I stopped. I was probably playing while well, I did have matches where I was playing in the three. I mean, they've had bounce and matches that played in the threes. Still, I was probably playing like 4.5, but 4.5 apparently was best at that point. At that um, time, yeah. But I mean, now you're even better. So, I mean, what are, what are the things that you've done? Sure, sure. I, I, I understand that. But I'm saying I was playing 4.5. And, and my rollouts, I'm not, uh, I don't want to um, like emphasize the rollouts. Too much. I mean, they certainly benefited me uh, for some reference positions and uh, and a better feel for the game in in some ways. But but even some of my rollouts were, were not perfect. If anybody's familiar, without going into too much depth with the rollouts, but I would do a lot of rollouts where you wouldn't play the game to conclusion. You do what are called truncated rollouts, and so you go maybe three or four rolls deep on each shot until you felt you were in a position where you could have a decent guess as to the value. But it turned out that, of course, a lot of those estimations were, were not off by like 0.1. I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but I think some of those estimates were poor. So it was like garbage in, garbage out. I mean, you know, I, I think I was advancing. I'm sure they were worth something. But I think that that was another obsessive, um, you know, uh, tool or way of going about things that benefited me a little bit and, and was probably by other people, they would have assumed, oh, that was like the key. And uh I, I don't think so. Any, anyhow, that was back then. So now I have XG, which doesn't do like these, you know, suspect, high, you know, truncated estimates and everything, but has, even if it has imperfections, we won't go into those and back games and snakes and all these different things. It has some, some but it's still better than anybody that we know, um, you know at, at this point. And, and I'm pretty open-minded. Like if you, if you can show me that something's wrong, I, I'm going to, and I trust you as a source, um, I'm going to go with that and then try to figure out what the story is, what the explanation is. And you won't always come up with it, but my get my my backhand in mind was still quite fresh. It was it had been in hibernation, but it was still, you know, it's, it's not like they reinvented backhand and they just made it better by use of this tool. You could play better. So yeah, when, when I when I first got, I didn't play with my son at first. I was on I was stuck at the DMV or something, some weird week in Las Vegas. And I called my son. I said, how do I get XG? Because I never, I didn't have jellyfish, didn't have snowy before when I retired. And he told me, and so I'm like playing it in the in the hotel room, you know, and, and I'm, I can be pretty, you know, addictive nature if you give me a chance. There's nothing else to do. I didn't want to go, you know, roaming around the casino. So anyhow, I'm, I'm playing against it. And I began like playing, I was like, maybe like, 4.0. I don't know. For some reason, I was playing maybe slightly better, but 4.0 without matches. So that was probably the way I was playing for most of And then I kept taking notes and doing the same kind of things I would have done before. I mean, some was just letting it wash over me, but some was taking notes about particular things that you want to do or not do as much and, you know, and it's sort of the opening flow of the game. And yeah, between notes and letting it wash over me, um, it's going to sound a little bit crazy, but I'm just giving you the details the way they were. After six weeks, I wasn't in the hotel room for six weeks. I did, I did, I was liberated to go home. Um, but I, I, I was still on vacation, vacation time. So after six weeks, and I don't know how many hours, but I think it was like I played some matches and some money games, 
I had a batch of 500 money games where I played 2.8. So my learning, and I'm not saying 2.8 was real because it's 500 games, you know, it's still not a huge sample in reality, but it's, yeah, my ability to learn and my, um, my, my love of the game or, or my connection with the game is very, very strong. And uh, I, you know, beyond that, that, that was the same kind of methodology, not so much XG later, but playing people and, reviewing, you know, mistakes that I made, you know, things that everyone does. I just, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I got good a long time ago and, and that the formula, the inner formula or the mental mechanics kind of stayed with me. Yeah. Yeah. That's outstanding. And, you know, it shows you back up to the top of the giants list, winning tournaments, uh, that tournament, the New York tournament is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the largest tournament in the United States in terms of attendance. And not only that, the, the, the field was very, very strong. So you had a tough field to go through. I know we're going to discuss a position from the finals, but before we do that, do you have any other things you want to say about some of those matches? Were there any tough ones or were there any moments where you felt were, was particularly challenging? Um. Yeah, as far as what you were saying, I, I think this was this was also the biggest field that they had had. It was 150 in the main, so it's the biggest ABT field since the ABT uh, came along 20 years ago or whenever that was. I, I uh, of the people I played, so I don't want to um, uh, the, the, not, nothing negative about anyone that I played, right? I mean, they're they're all like it, it, there's a range of players. I played a couple people in the first. Um, four rounds who um, cl clearly were solid players, I mean, not naming names, but I mean, clearly solid players, a couple of whom, one of whom I, I knew somewhat. And then we got to the, to the last three rounds and I played Kit Woolsey in the um, in the quarterfinals. And um, Kit, Kit is terrific. I think, you know, Kit could be 100. I think he's still going to play good backgammon. And, uh, <laughs> he's and a legend. That, it, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a pleasure to to compete uh, with him. And then I played uh, Joey Issa, who's uh, yes. well known, uh, he and his family in, in Jamaica. And uh, I had not met him before, but a very nice guy. And, and we had a, a good match. And then Dennis Culpepper in finals. And Dennis has been a very strong player for forever. When I retired, he was a strong player and he's still a strong player. And and, uh, and and that was a good match. It turned out that I don't believe maybe one of the people that I beat will call and say, "Hey, wait a minute, you know, I, I did this and that." But I don't think any of them scored more than seven points. The, the, the tournament's formatted; it's eleven points throughout. Um, I, I would prefer as a final, as especially it's isolated on the final day, that the finals be fifteen or something to distinguish itself from all the other matches. But that's I'm making a strong comment about that. So all the matches were 11, and I, I think my average score is like 11 to 5 or something like that. It's very unusual, because usually whether you win a tournament or you come close or something, very often you've won some you know, DMPs and just uh, right. everything fell into place for – that's just how it happened. Uh, I know the uh, finals was, of course, streamed, and there was a live commentary, and I don't know if I – mentioned this to you but i was watching the stream and during that time i got an email from knack ballard and it was about something else like my dice distribution spreadsheet so i was kind of emailing him back and forth and i said by the way are you watching wilcox snellings being live streamed in the finals of the new york tournament and he said oh i didn't know he's playing again <laughs> <laughs> So um, that was nice. Of course, that one uh, was recorded and streamed. Were the other were any of the other ones recorded? Yeah, yeah. The the so the one against Kit was recorded, and the one against uh, Joey was was recorded. Uh, which uh, those will be available, I, I suppose, soon somewhere so, somehow. I've actually I've, I've seen the PRs. I haven't gone through the matches on that. Uh, did turn out that for the final three matches, my average was 2.5, which was a it was a shock to me. You know, like I felt like I was playing well, but you never know. And you've also been traveling, and you're getting like a little more tired. And I've got family. Um, I think there's some randomness to that. I, I think if I had to play those matches again, 
you know, it might be three or something. It's still terrific, of course, but um, yeah, that was a pretty, pretty cool because I you you always want to win, but you know, I, I think um that depends on on who you are. But I know almost all the elite players, uh if if they win, that they play, they play poorly. It, it just it, there's a bad taste in your mouth that you don't want to share with others because it sounds like you're spoiled. But, that, but that's just that's the pride that you take in how you play. Right, right. And uh as someone who knows you as well as I do, you know, mostly online, obviously, um, that level of performance is not a shock to me. So uh, congratulations. Some of the things I sometimes do, uh, you may have seen some of the matches that I do commentary on. Sometimes I get it from the USBGF and do a commentary. Um, that would be a good one. I'd love to do that one uh, between you and Kit Woolsey. And of course, you would be invited to join me on the commentary if you'd like to do that. Um, in the future at some point. Um, that would always be fun. Um, okay, so there was uh, one position. I know in um, these videos, the interviews, uh, people really enjoy uh, looking at a position. So uh, I picked out an interesting position from the finals uh, against Dennis Culpepper that um, we can go through. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. And... Uh, Give me just a moment. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Are you able to see the screen now? Uh, no, I see the one that has all the pictures. Yeah, so I wanted to show this briefly so, so people can see this is the, they're going to be the cover of the video. Um, the background has the uh, a board that's similar to the one you were playing on, and it has this position where there was a critical 6-1 uh, where you won the match, and at the top is where you're playing uh, against Dennis Culpepper. Um, at the bottom, you're with Lee Janude, Lee Janude and Karen Davis. Um, at the Hall of Fame induction, and on the right, you have some pictures with your family. Um, I thought that was uh, very appropriate for this one. Um, was this uh, on the lower right? You're having dinner with your family. Was that after? Or when was that? It, yes, that 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 was after. <laughs> that was that was that was basking. So celebration. Yeah, great, yeah. great. Um, okay, so now here is the position. Um, I don't have the players' names on here, but um, this was uh, Larry Schiller's board, the voice of backgammon. And that was, that was really nice, a nice board. Um, I actually spoke with Larry about the commentary before, and he did, he did an outstanding job. You were playing the white checkers at the top. Dennis was playing the red checkers at the bottom. As you mentioned, this was an 11-point match. Uh, and the score was 10-4 in your favor. So one away, seven away, and it was post-Crawford. Um, so the cube has already been turned. You own the cube, and it looked like um, Dennis did an early double-five blitz, and you managed to escape. Um, and now Dennis has two back checkers, um, and you have a 6-1 to play from here. So what was what was your thought process? when you were uh, playing? Yeah, I, I, what I, I don't know if I literally, if I physically tested out making the bar point, I, I think it's possible that I did, or I certainly did it in my mind. And then, and then I, I backed it up again, either physically or in my mind. And, and I, I made the five and I think the whole thing, it felt like, again, you can see in the video, which I haven't seen, but it felt like the whole thing took me maybe 30, 45 seconds, like it seems sort of important, but um, I don't know, you're sort of in a comfort zone, like you've escaped, you've rolled a 6-1 from this position, you know, you're feeling not necessarily going to win the game, but the, but the gammon threat has been you know, reduced considerably from where it was a couple of rolls ago. And uh, and I, I think I sort of probably physically shrugged and, and like I didn't know I felt as if, if I had to guess, which is often the baseline for these decisions, what would you do for money? And, and obviously the score is very relevant here. So, but what would you do for money just as a baseline? And so if I thought it was 50-50, then I, I would clearly make the bar point because there's no use giving double fours and six four and, um, and six two as, as hit shots. Um, 
that that would clearly push it in the other direction. So so you make a different play. But but I I sort of thought that that making the five point is likely to be correct for money. Um, by how much I didn't know, but I thought maybe it's enough that it's pretty close to pick them here. So I'm just going to make the five point. I'm not going to belabor this thing because unlike my other matches, I tend to play pretty quickly. Um, I definitely used a, a lot of clock in this match. And it was, I think, a couple of positions where I took three or four minutes on a key, key cube decision because you're winning the match by a lot and and uh, you know, you're redoubling and it's figuring out you know, whether someone has 10% or not, that sort of thing. So my time bank wasn't down to a minute, but it was down maybe to three minutes. And who knows how long the match is going to go on. I just didn't want to take forever over something that I didn't know the answer to. And sort of like, how bad could the five point be? Which is sometimes people fall back on. It's not always correct, of course. And um, yeah, that's kind of all I have to say about it. I now know the answer, but I'll let you talk now. Yeah, we'll go through that. I believe um, one of my friends, uh, Matt Congeyer, told me one time, if you can ever make the five point and then there's an alternative play, you have to really find a good reason not to make the five point. Um, so in this position, the benefits of making the five point are, of course, you make a two point board against the three point board. Otherwise, you only have a one to three uh, ratio of, of board strength. Additionally, you're able to unstack the heavy six point, which is difficult to unstack. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you make the bar point, uh, you do make a blocking structure. You don't leave any fly shots, as you mentioned. It does unstack the midpoint, but then all of your outfield points are stripped, which makes things a little bit inflexible uh, in the future. Um, it turns out, of course, at, at this score, I'll show the answer. Here's the XG analysis. It uh, And like when, you, when you're trained to be like top player, it's kind of like the default in these types of situations is to make the five point. Um, and then probably not make the bar point. It turns out here it's better to make the bar point. And what are what are your thoughts as to the reason? Right, and that's what I do. It's like if I make an error, I try to figure out why. You know, what, why was it an error? What what was wrong in my thinking, or what's practical here? So, and it turns out for money, actually for money, the bar point is right as well by like 0.02. Uh, so I was at least correct that the difference between this score and, and money probably wasn't too dramatic, but it turned out the baseline was that the bar point was right. Uh, one thing I'll a shout out to Bill Roberti. I forget his exact phrasing. You might recall it, but you know he says when you've got your all your men escaped, um, in barring situations where you can go for playing for a gamut or something like that, but but keep things pretty simple. Like you're not the, the payoff to you know to give uh, you know five hit numbers versus zero. Is considerable where you know, especially where your opponent has a better board and so on. Um, that's that you know that that's a pretty good principle. The other thing is that if you make your bar point, yeah, you've got all these strip points and your six point is still stacked. But if you actually look at your next rolls, let's just say that your opponent did nothing because he probably is going to stay split anyhow because making an anchor is not what he's doing. He's trying to get shots. Um, and you look at how your next numbers play, most of them play reasonably well. You're either you know, bringing a man down to the, the seven or eight point or possibly making, uh, you know, if you got lucky with some doubles or uh, you know, even a number like three one, you get to make the 10 point, at least a couple of fly shots. But again, it's, uh, it, it's or four two, you can't make your four point because you leave a ball in the eight, but you can make your nine point. And, nine and or a number, great number like six five, where you actually bring you know, two builders down. You really don't have any. I, I I think there might be one one weird number. I'm not even sure if it's if there's one one number you have to leave a direct shot, which, which is really really important. Like you went through these numbers and said, well, okay, a lot of the numbers don't improve your position dramatically, but they're not leaving shots. They're very often providing you with an extra builder or two, you know, to uh, to help you down the road, and uh, that's a pretty good part of the solution you know other than the fact that naturally you kind of want to make your five point this position is not uh it's not as stiff as it looks or, or or to the extent that it looks stiff right now it's going to look more fluid uh shortly in most cases right right it's it's interesting because it will look at the the some variations 
And at money, the equity is worth a lot more than here. And that's because of the score. You have such a big lead. Uh, you really don't want to lose a gammon. And you see uh, making the five point loses 5.1% gammons versus 3.7. So uh, that's important at this kind of score. Um, you don't want your opponent to get to three away versus five away. Um, that's big. And then let's see some of the variants. This is for money. So it's a 24 millipoint error to make the five point um, for money. But look at the equities. It's 678 here versus at the score, it's 323. That's like half. So that demonstrates how, how important the score is. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. So let's see. I think we have some variants to look at. I feel like that's a useful way to kind of learn. Um, this is one variant. So what did I do here? Oh, now here, this is a variant where you're at gam and go, right? So it's 9, 10 in favor of the opponent, Crawford. So right. now... It yeah, I mean, he, here you want to make the inner void points because if, if your opponent doesn't anchor, you're looking to attack and increase the chance that you win a gammon to win the match. And then the additional gammon losses that you lose by getting hit are not relevant because the gammon loss does not matter at this score. Um, okay, the next score is a gammon save. So now you're at gammon save. Yeah, so, and, and and I think I would have gotten this right because, I mean, the other, you're still worried about gallons, but here it's life or death getting gallons. So. Right, right. And then the next score is DMP. So, at, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, tell me tell me your thoughts of DMP, how you would play it differently. Well, well DMP's back to like a heavy emphasis on the race and playing it simple again, I, I think. Um, yeah, there's just no no reason to give shots. I mean, in, in a sense, like if I had thought, which I wasn't, because again, time bank and you gotta just make a play at some point. Um, but if, it, if, if my feeling would have been, and I think it would have been slightly uh, to just make the bar DMP, then Given the given the, the you know the, the one way effectively the one way gammon situation that I should have just made the same play, but I didn't think in terms of DMP. Yeah, this is actually a good good lesson when you when you look at these, it's it's good to kind of learn uh, why the play is right. But then you look at some of these things, and it, and it brings a lesson. Like sometimes I teach my students at DMP. Of course, gammon and backgammon wins and losses do not matter. However, the other important thing about DMP is there is no doubling cube. Therefore, every game must be played to its conclusion. And ultimately, in that case, every game becomes a race. So if you're ahead in the race, you want to be more conservative. And in particular, if you don't have any checkers back, like you mentioned earlier, you, you don't want to send another checker back or send one checker back when your opponent has two checkers back. So... That this is a good learning opportunity for people um, for DMP. Um, okay, so this was the original position at the original score of 10 4. Uh, and now I, we have I, a few, yeah, I, yeah. I, I just to interject that, uh, yeah, like, like anybody, it doesn't matter how many of the internal like reminders or uh, reference positions or whatever it is that you've got in your sort of memory bank of, of, of things to uh, consider. That, that that I do, I mean, just saying right there that I didn't think in terms of what, what would I do at DMP. I think um, Stick, Jacob Rice is one of the one of the great U.S. players and one of the outstanding players in the world and a great coach and has many like, print, good principles and everything else. Um, you know, he's one that says, you know, when, when in doubt, you know, like the DMP, the DMP play is almost always correct. Now that doesn't mean there are some big exceptions or you know gammons, but but you know he he swears by that, and I think he's he's studied the game over the last I don't know fifteen years probably as much or, or more than nearly anyone else, and uh, and and I I don't tend to think in terms of what would I do at, at DMP very often. It just sort of occurred to me that I that I don't. So just, that's all I had to say about that. Yeah, that's that's a good point. 
Um, so this is the original position, and I made some variance to see what changes would be made. Um, so here, move it up one point from the three point to the four point, and now making the five point as a blunder. So yeah. why well, would part you- Part of that is the extra hits on the 11 point, right? Now now there are eight numbers that are going to hit that checker. Right, um, right. As opposed to five the, the other way. That's, fine. That's a pretty big swing. Yeah, here, if you make the five point, it's six, two, six, four, and double four, right? Right. So here it's the six sevens plus six, four. So that's eight numbers, right? Exactly. I think I said seven for some reason. That's right. Yeah, and that's and yeah, seven or eight, but eight, eight is definitely a really big swing. It's too risky. So you see that. This is this is a good way for people to learn and analyze it and see like what like one pit makes a huge difference and then try to see why. Um, the next variant, uh, I actually moved it back. And it's a little bit closer to make the five point now because it's a little farther and there are fewer fly shots. Um, there's the five, four, and six, four, and six, three. So there's six of them. Well, the six, three wouldn't work after this one. So five, four, and six, four, four of them, right? Right. I I, I think there may be some subtle, subtle thing going on. Obviously, there's really no change from before. But despite the fact there's one fewer hit shot, on the other hand, uh, the back men for red, once you've made the bar point, Unless your opponent rolls, like, what, what is he going to do with certain numbers? He's not, he's obviously, he's looking to roll an ace because that's probably the optimal place to, to have a checker to put pressure on, on the nine point. Um, any, any blots that may show up in the outfield, hitting more outfield shots, maybe with a two. But if he doesn't roll an ace or a deuce, he's still sitting back there, which, which allows you um, to leave fewer shots as you're bringing men down from the midpoint. Yeah, yeah. And okay, so let's see what's the next variant I did. Uh, this was the original one. Now I move this checker here. Yeah, so, this, this is interesting, right? Yeah, I tried to kind of weaken the opponent's front position to see what happens. And this is still approximately the same. It's still better to make the bar point. Um, and then in this variation, I move the three point to the two point. So that's a weaker offensive structure. And it's still, still about the same. And then I yeah. saw like how much yeah, you that's have. Not, that's not much, much weaker because that that blot on the nine is sort of not not as functional on on the, if you own the three point. Right. Right. Three point. right. Right. That right. should be a wash, sort of. But if you go to here, that weakens it substantially. So now, the plays become much closer. Yeah, I mean, but bottom line, even though a lot of these are relatively discrete. It's uh yeah you just uh, you just just play it play it tight it's such a sport yeah uh, what else did I do I brought this back now I tried to strengthen the board so now it's stronger it's a it's more clear to make the bar point and then I made it even stronger and now it becomes an even bigger error to make the five point and this this makes more sense I mean this this is like a lot easier position too. Make yeah, albeit, albeit it's still a 0 0.01 more than my original position, right? Because that was 0 0.05 difference is 0 0.06. So we really, despite the fact that the structure has improved a lot, now we can yeah. find not simply uh, yeah. have some kind of blitz. I as think well. that was, yeah, that was, uh, that was the last variant. So, yeah, I think. That was that was a very interesting position for me. I, I remember uh, Larry and Phil were discussing this um, during the commentary. Um, and it's actually very educational, not only to see the XG analysis, but to hear your thoughts about what you were thinking and, you know, how you approach these. Um, it helps people learn and get better. Yeah, and, and hopefully have them realize that there's not like some black box scientific thing going on in, you know, in, in our minds. I mean, for the, you know, I'm just speaking for myself. I mean, I don't know how other people's backgammon minds uh, operate at times. And I'm sure there's some, some, some differences, but um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, like I said, it, eventually I just sort of shrugged. It's not that I didn't care, but you've got to make a play. Time is getting a little bit precious. 
And I went off of, yeah, that kind of basic premise that if you're, if you're not sure, it's probably the five point. Despite the fact I was thinking of the score is relevant, but I don't know, e even, you know, I, e even I occasionally will not gloss over the score, but you sort of gloss over, there are not that many hit shots. It's got this gappy three point board. Um, but of course they're going to be incremental, in incrementally more gamuts. It's like, yeah, okay, 5.1 is still not a lot, but compared to 3.7 and at, at such a score, of course, I didn't know these numbers, but I, I knew it had to be small. You just don't feel like you're going to be gambling. But not feeling like you're going to be gambling versus getting gambling 5% is like, it's a very big difference. Yeah. Well, good. That was, that was fantastic. I always learn a lot hearing uh, your comments, uh, whether it's on these videos or on the online forums. Uh, I wanted to express my appreciation and gratitude for all the things you contribute, you know, online and in these videos and, and everywhere and congratulate you well-deserved uh, in terms of your induction into the Hall of Fame, as well as winning this major tournament and an outstanding weekend uh, visiting your family as well. Um, do you have any other uh, comments before we conclude? Anything else you'd like to share? Um yeah, you know, th th this has been really good as, as far as, uh, you know, participate. I, I don't think there's anyone, you know, imagining that, okay, now, now that I have that, that week, it's sort of like a drop mic time. I'll be back in 20 years. So that's, that's not my intention at all. <laughs> I still have my career and I probably won't retire for another uh, year or two. So it's still going to be very sporadic, uh, my attendance at tournaments. But, but I will, assuming my health is fine, which it is so far. Um, I do plan to, uh, you know, attend several different U.S. tournaments. Um, yeah, I'm sure more than once. I, I, I know um, San Antonio is perhaps the first one that I'm going to, it depends on the time of the year and everything else begins, but San Antonio, uh, L.A., I uh, get back to Chicago uh, once, uh, hit, uh, you know, the Washington, D.C., Florida. You know, I, I, plan, I plan to be around a, a bit, not, not to sort of hide out at the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. from Europe. Yes, I know your off season is typically in the summer, right? Yeah, and I have been going to, um, I've gone to Monte Carlo uh, three times in the last five years. Th this year, I'm going to go to Marbella. So I'm going to, I'm going to no. challenge all, all these, all these young guys with their great PRs and, and, <laughs> and see how I fare. Um, and, and I realize that's not, it's not just, you know, ability to play or having a low PR in general, but it's, a little bit of a stamina contest over there with as many matches as you're playing for four days or whatever it is. Yeah, it's really remarkable nowadays where in the past you had to just have years or decades of experience to become a really good player. But now with the computer, you could be like a teenager and <laughs> be really one of the top. Yeah, we've got, I don't know all the players, but I mean, I would say of the ones I'm either lightly or quite aware of, I think there are six that are playing, you know, between between probably like 2.8 and 3.8, who are in the age range of um, 19 to 26. So yeah, just just you know, backing up what you're saying, it's you know, that that's just the way it is. I mean, by the by the time I actually do retire, I mean, you know, the, the new norm for the top five will be 2.2 or something. I, I don't really, I, you know, the people who say, oh, there's going to be like, you know, someone's going to be playing 1.9. Yeah, I mean, could Mochi play 1.9? Maybe. I mean, I'm not going to say that he can't. I mean, as a legitimate long-term average, um, he played Monte Carlo at 2.1 over entire tournaments. So it's certainly, it's certainly yeah. possible. But the consistency is so difficult because the variations of things, and plus you're human, you know. It's not, you're not a machine. And uh, anyhow, it, it's interesting, but it's like everything in life. I mean, everything becomes more efficient and the gap between the best and, and, and runners up become tighter and tighter in sports, you know, with the track and field. Yeah. Well, you've lasted a long time, even after taking a substantial break. So congratulations again. It's, it's really a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Alex. Um, it's, it's, as I said, it's always a pleasure to have you. You're certainly welcome to come back. You have an open invitation. And you know, we do have a tournament here in Los Angeles where I live in the summertime. And if you're able to make it, uh, I'd like you to be my guest, I'll take you out to dinner 
uh, with your wife or family. Uh, I'd love to see you. Um, that's always a pleasure. I, I have I've had the privilege of meeting so many of the top players around the world. I know you're originally from the United States, but now you live overseas in Costa Rica. So I meet people virtually, and it's always a hope for me to meet uh, all of these people in person. So I, I hope to uh, do that one day. Um, looking forward to that. Um, so thank you again. We'll go ahead and conclude. Uh, and you, you always have an open invitation to come back for any other videos, whether it's a match or interview or whatnot. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to the viewers for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe, and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and what you'd like to see in future videos so I can work on that. Again, my my book, Backgammon, Backgame Strategies, uh, is available. There's a link in the description uh, to where you can get it. And thank you again to Wilcox because you did review a lot of it and provide a lot of useful feedback. And um, that was fantastic. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, if viewers are interested in lessons, please contact me via email. My email address is in the description. I look forward to seeing everyone in future videos. And until then, keep rolling your dice.